Our next guest at the India Today Conclave has one of the biggest shoes to fill in Indian business. As the son of Azim Premji, he is the inheritor of one of the proudest legacies in corporate India. He's taken over very recently as the chairman of the highly respected information technology behemoth Vipro. He's usually hugely reclusive and rarely speaks in public. But make no mistake, he is one of the most important Indian corporate leaders and shall remain so for several decades to come. So it's very important to know what he thinks and the direction in which he is taking Vipro and Indian information technology. The India Today conclave is being organized at a time when automation and artificial intelligence are changing what companies do and what employees working in these companies are expected to do. The nature of the workforce is being transformed at a speed greater than ever before in history. And the future of the workforce has never been more uncertain. To talk about creating a culture of enlightened capitalism and the future of the Indian workforce, I want you to join me in welcoming to the India Today Conclave the new chairman of Vipro, Rishad Fremji. He's also making his debut at the India Today Conclave. So can we have a very warm round of applause for the young man, please? Rishad, welcome. Thank We're you. delighted to have you with us. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation. You have one of the biggest shoes to fill in Indian business. You've recently taken over one of the most coveted positions in corporate India. How's it going? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting because I feel very blessed, to be honest, and the overwhelming emotion is energy and excitement. But I've got a great platform to build off, you know, great opportunities built with great credibility over the last 50 years of the company. We were founded before the independence of India, as I was telling you, in the green room. And so I'm very, very blessed. You know, one of our board members said this to me when I was taking over, and everybody uses this line which says, you know, you've got big shoes to fill. And he said, you know, tell people that you're not going to be able to fill big shoes, but you'll try and stitch your own, and hopefully with hard work and good luck, and that's the journey I'm on. That's the, so that's point number one, right? Um, the, the other big learning I've had, uh, Rahul, in life is, you know, it's very difficult to live up to other people's expectations and try and live their dreams for you or their dreams about you, and you can do the best that you are capable of doing. And in life, I think it's very important to stay very focused on giving your best. And if you've given your best, then you can hope for whatever outcomes come from giving your best, but you can't do much more than that. And that's what you can focus on, that's what you can control. So I don't worry too much about outcomes and things I can't control. I focus on things I can control. And so I don't feel overwhelmed, I feel excited and energized. Is there a burden you carry of every action you take and every move you make being weighed against how your father would have handled the same situation? And is that something that weighs you down, makes you think twice over? It doesn't. And I'm, I'm quite a sensitive person, but I don't worry too much about what other people think. Life is exhausting trying to live other people's plans, as I said. So I don't worry too much about what other people think. So How much. is the new Wipro you craft and create going to be different from the Wipro you inherited? No, look, I mean, the journey is long and the opportunities are tremendous. And the reality is, Rahul, that the technology industry is very disruptively changing. If you think about IT services in India over the last 15, 20 years, where all of us were really at the right place at the right time and got very, very lucky, right? People came to India for cost, they stayed for quality, and everybody made money because of scale. And that was the model for the last 20 years. What, what has fundamentally changed is how pervasive technology has become in the hands of people like you and me. So the amount of compute we have in our hand the amount of data that it produces is very disruptively changing what our, we as consumers are asking us of our enterprises, who are our customers. So for example, if I'm a bank, I've got to think about an account opening process without somebody walking into a branch or dealing with a teller. It's a profound change for a bank. If I'm a hospital, how do I create the true hospitality experience from the time a patient checks in to the time she checks out? If I'm a retailer, how do I create the true omni-channel experience where I can look at something online, pick it up in store, vice versa, etc., etc. Those are profound changes for companies. And most companies that haven't thought about being very experience-led, customer at the center of it all like this. And so that creates tremendous opportunities for companies like us. And so how do you drive this very 
customer centric highly design centric where you're reimagining rearchitecting reengineering the process for customers and then helping them build and run that and historically companies like us have had strength in the build and run technology coming into play but more and more we're moving upstream to play in this think in this design space which is becoming the right to then play downstream so i am very very hopeful this is you know what a lot of the, i define this as digital transformation and digital disruption but this tremendous opportunity so i feel very blessed and i'm not an optimistic person i'm usually more of a realist but i'm very hopeful for where things can go for the technology industry in india in general i was reading a report by two oxford professors which says that by 2030 uh, 69% of all formal jobs in the middle skill level will vanish that's a pretty alarming figure is that something you think is of huge concern because it is for those whose jobs could vanish how do you think that will be addressed you know I, I, I don't react so much i find you know statistics quite easy to quote and some of them are sensationalistic some of them are alarming you know um, the favorite statistic i use when i joined wipro 12 years ago people said that the cloud industry everything moving to the cloud would be you know 150 billion dollars big and 12 years later i'm still waiting for that to happen right so so things move at different paces and i don't sort of get too carried away by what i read but let me say this look any change and disruption in technology creates anxiety if you think about when the pc revolution happened people thought the jo jobs would go away when you thought about the erp revolution happening people thought jobs would go away and now with artificial intelligence it's certainly more profound it's more disruptive but i think there'll be jobs in three different buckets there will be jobs that will no longer be relevant because they're highly repeti repetitive they're highly structured uh they can be easily sort of automated you know jobs like bookkeeping and data entry and those kinds of things uh there'll certainly be jobs that are highly of high human and social intelligence and relevance that i think will continue jobs like teachers jobs like caregivers sales and marketing professionals i don't think i don't suspect those jobs are going away but then there is a whole bunch of jobs in the middle which i am very excited about which is really human machine interface so how can human beings come together with intelligence to drive augmentation around that so what well, i assisted ai if you want to call it that you know how can i help a radiologist be a better radiologist and read scans better you know how can you help a driver be a better driver how can you help a lawyer be a better lawyer by essentially for example reading contracts and identifying non compliance to a contract how can i help a doctor read a, a scan better and be a more a better doctor it also has huge implications socially because i can leverage the time of the doctor which is a scarce commodity in the country like india more impactfully if she is spending 25 minutes reading a particular patient she can spend 10 minutes or 15 minutes and her time can be better leverage so i'm hugely hopeful for this huge bucket in the middle that can be leveraging technology to do their jobs better and i think that will create tremendous amount of opportunity tremendous amount of jobs and tremendous amount of social impact stephen hawking made headlines in 2014 when he said that the development of artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race and elon musk said that you know ai is humanity's biggest existential challenge how do you at the proceed so it's still very early days you know I, you know these are big statements and i'm not seeing that play out yet but i so i think it's important to sort of take that into context right i think it's also important to take into context that many things that artificial intelligence can automate can be components or pieces of jobs as opposed to entire jobs right so 5% of a particular job or 10% of a particular job gets changed it doesn't mean the entire job is getting changed however i think it's important to recognize that this is a profound change in technology and so with it comes an importance to think through the right governance what are the right social norms that need to be in place to allow the technology to flourish and exist impactfully and thoughtfully without creating huge social disruption i think it's important technology is not going to grow organically it's going to grow through human beings and so it's important that you know governance and regulation play an important role so how well do you place india is to use all the levers of the fourth industrial revolution to drive its growth into the future are we doing enough are we moving fast enough or is this another revolution that could leave us behind no i think very much so that it's we're very core and center to it i think the government is very thoughtfully thinking through what the right ai construct for the country should be what the right sort of frame of reference should be and i think those are important things for us to be thinking through as this technology unfolds so we shouldn't get 
we shouldn't get too worried about it. We should certainly think about things and implications that it has. So, for example, you know, something that I read, which is, you know, it could, you know, with autonomous, autonomous cars, it could take away driving jobs. I, I suspect that that's going to be unlikely in India for a long time. But, however, if that was the case, that's a thoughtful thing to take into consideration. Several million people in the country are employed driving cars or taxis, etc. So I think it's important to have a framework which takes into consideration how impactfully can you be leveraging As the there's more and more automation, it takes that much more growth to create more employment. Uh, recent data suggests that it takes about 10% growth in GDP to create 1% new employment. Uh, how do you see the job crisis in the country or the opportunity, the demographic dividend we speak about? Do you think we're optimally placed to leverage it or could it be headed towards a disaster? No, I think you certainly have to think through things like reskilling. I think that's an important component and I can just give you the example that we live through in the IT industry because the IT industry is going through a fair amount of transformation in terms of the way it delivers its own work, right? I'll share with you something very, I think, fairly scaled that we as an industry are driving through NASCOM, which is the technology body that represents the IT industry, the, you know, something called the Future Skills Platform, uh, which the Prime Minister actually la launched last year in 2018 in February. There are three components to that, which I'm very excited about. One is in the fa first phase, how do you reskill two million of the four million people that are directly employed by the industry? And there's a huge focus on leveraging this platform. It's highly curated to an individual's ability to grow, to get assessed. To, so it's highly self-paced. Uh, gives you huge opportunities to reskill. And the big mindset shift that has happened, Rahul, is people, at least who are employed in the technology industry, are recognizing that if they don't reskill themselves, they're going to get left behind. So this openness to recognize that people have to change with the time. So that's one big effort. effort. The second is how do you work with universities? And how do you work with universities to enhance the capacity of teachers leveraging sort of human intervention as well as online intervention so that they can be better teachers and produce better students in new age technologies, right? We're working today with three universities. I think over the next two to three years, we'll work with 100 universities. These are working with four, 5,000 you know, 5, teachers who are then working with one is to 30, one is to 40 students. It scales quite quickly, and I think there can be a huge ripple effect of how Reskilling and the mindset of reskilling sort of becomes all pervasive. And the third thing which the government is playing a very active role in is how do you open up this platform to citizens? So how can citizens reskill? So I think this mindset that nothing is going to change perhaps may leave you behind. But it already but happened in the IT sector. So many people in the middle of their career suddenly found themselves left behind by technology because they'd reached a certain position in terms of salaries, in terms of designations, and there were younger engineers with more relevant contemporary but the numbers skills. don't reflect that, Rahul. So if I look at the IT industry, we added 150,000 jobs last year. The people, we, still, we are still a net employer. You had 150,000 direct jobs, you probably had another 500,000 indirect jobs. So the IT industry is still adding jobs. The nature of those jobs perhaps has changed. The skill required to deliver those jobs is not as relevant, you know, that was relevant five years ago, may not be relevant today. It's much more focused around the new age technologies, but the IT industry, despite all the, sort of the buzz that you're sharing, is a net job creator in the country today. Th so that is, tells me something. There's an ASCOM FIKI report that came out which said that 9% of India's 600 million workforce uh, in the next five years, that's about 54 million people, will be deployed in jobs that don't exist at this moment. I'm very curious to know your thoughts as the father of a young child about bringing up a child for a job in the future which doesn't exist at this moment. Yeah. No, I think that the, the, the biggest skill, you know, and I worry about this at all levels, is learnability and continuous learning. I think that's the most important non-technical skill if you can develop and own. That's the skill to have. So, you know, if I try to teach my child anything, it's the ability to constantly be open. It's the people who get fixated and aren't able to change that perhaps will get left behind. So if you ask me for the one skill that I focus on, that's the one thing I look on. In fact, when I look at people that, I re that I'm interviewing at a senior level, there are two things that I look for. I look for learnability and I look for teamwork. Those are the two most important things to me at least. Anybody who doesn't have learnability just gets fixated on ideas and, get, and then gets left behind. But so are you I'm also concerned about the kind of graduates who are coming out of most Indian colleges uh, and how they're suboptimally placed to be able to leverage the workforce of the future? No, I think, I think programs like the one I just described are helping 
What, what the Azim Premji University does is very important, but right. it's a small part in the larger universe and the challenge that we face as right. a nation. But I'll come to that in a second because that's completely unrelated to what we're talking about and it focuses at a much, much more grassroots level. But I think, look, certainly working with universities to enhance the capacity and the capability of students graduating is an important thing. And I'm talking from my vantage point, which is the technology industry. Certainly companies spend a fair amount of time training new graduates who've joined us. We all spend about 60 to 90 days upskilling people. So certainly upskilling the quality of talent, but also working downstream to enhance the capacity of talent coming out of universities is equally important. The Azim Premier University is focused on something completely different, which is working at a much, much more grassroots level, working to enhance the capacity of people in the education space predominantly. So our two major programs are a master's in education and a master's in development. We've just started a program which is a undergraduate program, which a Bachelor of Arts, and we set up, set up a Bachelor of Education, so people who can actually graduate to become teachers from the program. Our focus is very much in tier two, tier three cities and towns, encouraging people who join the university to go back into smaller towns. So it's a, it's a more philanthropic mindset than a commercial capitalistic mindset in terms of at least university that's graduate engineers who are looking to get big uh, high paying jobs. Amongst the IT majors in India, uh, there's been a traditional pecking order. Wipro got knocked off that order, you slipped one position. As a young inheritor of such a massive enterprise, how competitive are you? Is it like the ICC cricket ratings, one, two, three, does that matter a lot to you? Are you pushing hard to go from four to three and then climb up further? No, look, as I said, you know, you've got to give your best. It hurts to lose. It always hurts to lose. I think it's a natural human emotion. Nobody likes to lose. But look, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. And as I said, I'm quite optimistic. I think we're doing a lot of the right things. We're investing in some of the right areas. And the race is long. And, you know, I'm hoping that things do turn around and do change and we sort of move up the pecking order. But, but I don't obsess too much about it. You've got to focus and run your race. It's difficult sometimes running your race, looking to the left and right. It slows you down. So you've got to look in front and focus and do the best you can and hopefully end up in front. But at the same time, being aware of where people are around you at the same time. But you can't control that. So you focus on what are the kind control. of things about your father's style of working that you like, you would love to imbibe and take further into the future? And what is it like you, that you'd like to change? My father's a great listener, right? I think he's, uh, he speaks very little. And so he listens a lot and he listens to people of all levels. So that's very powerful. You know, you can learn from people at all levels, and most importantly, from people who are closest to the subject. And so people who are often several levels down from you. And I've learned that. I spend a lot of time with people in the trenches, so I get a good sense and pulse of what's going on. Um, you know, his style is uh, very non-judgmental. He doesn't hold things against people. He can get very, very frustrated with somebody and completely have forgotten it 15, 20 minutes ago. So he's not a judgmental person, doesn't hold grudges. Uh, and he is not afraid to say, I don't know. I mean, he can ask the most basic question in a, in a really high-powered meeting and say, I have no idea what this is. And I think that's very powerful as well, a humility to sort of be open to learning. You're very diplomatic. You very conveniently sidestepped the second part of the question, which is about what Actually, you don't like, not no, like I, to change. You know, it's... Um, and he will say this as well. I think I'm more empathetic than he is. I'm warmer with people than he is. I think that's a strength. You know, especially in a services business, you can engage with people more easily. Uh, and he will say that that's something that you have that I don't. And again, it's one of those he'll things. He'll say that it or you're idea. hoping he'll say No, I think he'll say it. I think he believes that. But that's one thing I would say that is probably, uh, that is different between us. You know, you've also been working in the startup space uh, through Wipro Ventures. You've invested in multiple startups. I'm curious to know uh, your thoughts on uh, you know, the programs that the government has started. Stand up, Startup India, Digital India. There's a lot of noise around them, but in terms of actual outcomes, they haven't uh, delivered just yet. In fact, there was a report which said about 90% of the new startups were failing on account of lack of innovation. Why do you think that's happening? You know, look, so one, I want to just say that a lot of our focus in Wipro Ventures is really global startups. We focus a little bit in Indian startups, but not so much on, but more so our focus is on global startups. But I, I really believe this, by the way, what I'm about to say, which is I really think the startup community can do for India what the technology and IT services industry did for India over the last 20 years in terms of brand building in terms of wealth creation and in terms of job creation. So I'm very, very optimistic and very, very hopeful in terms of what's coming out of the startup community in India. I think you're seeing more and more global companies, you're seeing more and more product companies emerge. 
I think you're seeing a mindset which is very profoundly changed over the last five or seven years, which is a mindset of extreme risk taking and the ability to accept failure and to move on from failure. Culturally, you know, five or seven, even ten years ago, if somebody had a conversation about a failed startup or a failed job, that was highly, highly unencouraged in social circles, in family circles. That's dramatically changed. People are quite proud to say, hey, I tried something, it didn't work and it's going to change. So I'm very, very hopeful in terms of what and where the startup community can go in India. And you just see it thriving and building and you see more and more large unicorns appearing, uh, more and more product companies appearing and they're more and more turning global, not only so focused on the India market but focused on the One of the well. critiques of the Indian IT sector over the past several years has been that while we've been fabulous at outsourcing and servicing, we haven't been as strong when it comes to product development. Take for example ByteDance in China. Uh, they've created something as bizarre as TikTok and look at how it's gone viral. Why are the TikToks of the world being created now in China and earlier in Silicon Valley and not in Bengaluru or Hyderabad? No, but I think you see it change and I think the main reason for this, look you have to appreciate that what the US had with Silicon Valley which is a space of deep innovation, deep capital, deep appetite for risk taking didn't exist in our country. That's changing very dramatically as we speak and I think having those three or four pieces in, in play make a tremendous difference to the way companies thrive and grow and survive. And so I'm very optimistic and very hopeful that in the next five years you'll start to see much more of this emerge from India. But how do you, what more do you believe needs to be done? By the ecosystem, by the government, in terms of policy, in terms of regulation? No, I, th I think that's happening. I think some of the tax, the government friendly policies, the tax friendly policies around angel tax. I think a huge capital base that is building, a huge risk taking appetite that has emerged. Uh, the confidence to build products that can serve global markets as opposed to predominantly being consumer internet focused. I think all of those mindsets are tremendously changing and you see early shoots of those kinds of companies emerging. A company like Freshdesk, I think is a fabulous company that serves the global market. So I am very optimistic uh, that things are coming into play that will drive this over the next five years. I want to draw you into the larger cop uh, conversation at this time around the state of the Indian economy. Uh, there's been a lot of gloom and doom about how growth has been slowing down. S given where you are at Wipro, how do you see the larger ecosystem? Look, I'm, I'm very optimistic again on this. Look, you know, the good news to me, at least things are cyclical, not structural. And things slow down and things pick up. I think the government certainly is very, very open to the idea of doing things and doing things disruptively. I had the opportunity to spend some time in a small group setting uh, with the finance minister about a month ago, I found her to be incredibly uh, open uh, to ideas, to doing things disruptively, to changing things up. You saw some of that happen yesterday. So I'm very optimistic that uh, things are moving, uh, things will change. You know, maybe it'll take a few quarters, but things will change. Mm -hmm. I want you to now look into your crystal ball and tell those young people who are sitting here listening to you, possibly watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, elsewhere, um, what the job market of the future will look like. Because one of the things you're most passionate about is the workforce of the future. If somebody is preparing for employment and jobs in the future, what are the kind of things they should be looking at? No, Rahul, we, we talked about this and I don't have a crystal ball unfortunately. But I, and, and the reality is jobs are dynamically changing. So it's very difficult to say today when I'm 10 or 12 or 15 years old that I'm going to prepare for this kind of job. Unless you're going into very specialized jobs, you know, I'm looking to become a a doctor or a scientist or those kinds of things, then you've got to specialize and plan for those kinds of jobs. But if you're looking to, uh, to get into more broad based jobs, I think you've got to have a mindset of being reskillable and retrainable and open to continuous learning. I just, it's as simple, there's no aha answer in my mind, it's as simple as that. So the ability if, if you were in to, school or college at this time, what kind of a job would you be preparing for? I don't know, something, in, I, me personally really want to know, what, something in the arts probably. <laughs> really, I mean, that's what really, that would interest me. But I mean, you know, I, 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 I did a, I, interesting, I'm not a technologist. I'm a general manager in the area of technology, right? I did a Bachelor of Arts in Economics. I took 15 classes in Economics over four years. So I learned a little bit about everything and didn't learn enough about anything, frankly. But I found what it did for me was it helped train my mind to be sort of open to ideas and open to sort of thinking creatively about problems. And so I find it a huge advantage actually in the technology space because I don't understand technology as a deep technologist. So 
to get to ask very basic questions. And do you think and, this and is you open people up on that? And so the value of technology actually is not in technology itself. It's in the problems it's looking to solve. It's what's the use case of that technology. So I'm constantly asking the question that, so how does this help? How does this solve a particular problem for us, for the customer? And I find it very powerful in an accidental way for myself. So I'm a big believer, by the way, in the arts. But do you believe this education. is also one of the problems with most IT engineers that they're so obsessed singularly with the STEM, STEM fields that they are not looking at liberal arts to be able to uh, just increase their scope of thinking? Correct. And that's why I was saying, you know, this continuous learning, this, this uh, future skills platform, we focused on 10 technical skills that are focused on a roughly 10, te 10 technologies that are focused on 155 skills and rough, excuse me, roughly 70 jobs, 70 specific jobs. So the objective of retraining there is very, very job specific. The focus is also on non-technical skills. And the two that we've started off with is continuous learning as a skill and creative problem solving, not logical problem solving, creative problem solving, which means how do you approach a problem in a very design reimaginative, recreating, re-architecting way as a, starting with the end consumer, the user, whether it can be an employee, whether it can be the end consumer and working back from that. We're spending a lot of time as a company trying to reskill our technical engineers to be much, much more business oriented. And the reason for that also is because technology today is also getting consumed by business owners, not only technologists. And they speak the language of business, they don't speak the language of technology. So you're getting your managers to learn new skills. Are you acquiring new skills yourself? What is it that you've learned most recently? No, I, I, you know, I have, because I'm not a technologist, I have somebody who's a person in the company who's my teacher. You know, he's like several levels below me, but he's fabulous. He's my guru as far as everything on technology is concerned. And I ask him all my dumb questions. I meet with him once every two weeks. And it's been a profound change for me in terms of learning new. So you have to be open from the top to learn all the time. So we spoke of legacy. One of the things that Mr. Premji is known for nationally is his philanthropic interests. As the inheritor of that legacy, how do you view philanthropy when it comes to billionaires? No, I think we as a family feel very, very strongly about it. We've been disproportionately, unfairly, and I use those words carefully, privileged and blessed in life, right? More than I think we deserve. And so it's a duty to sort of give back, right? And I'm very proud of the fact that 67% of Wipro now is irrevocably owned by the foundation. And it's remarkable how appealing that is to employees. It's remarkable how appealing it is to customers. The fact that 67 cents of every dollar you make from them goes back to a good cause. So it's a, it's a strong sentiment we all jointly feel and jointly have. And it's, uh, it's very powerful. Do you feel that other billionaires, and I won't take any names, should learn some lessons? No, I think there's a lot of, you know, I think the mindset of giving in, in India is very disruptively changing. And I think it's also changing very disruptively by the younger generation. So I find it's quite interesting to meet 20 something, 30 something year olds today that are very profoundly influencing uh, their parents and perhaps their grandparents and how they think about this. I think it's, very, it's disruptively changing and I'm quite hopeful that that will change, right? What kind of philanthropy interests you personally? So, so we, so my interests are very much aligned by what we do. Maybe I'll take a minute just because I'm very passionate about it to share what we do at the foundation. We do two things. One is we're focused on education, which is where we work with seven states with 350,000 schools, all in the government system. The beauty and the magic of India is that there's a school within a one to two kilometer walking radius of every child in the country. The challenge is how impactfully those schools actually work. And you know, being a technology company, and we've been around for 20 years, being a technology company, we try to throw technology at the problem, right? The big learning was that a child learns by a really impactful teacher. So how do you enhance the quality of the teacher to enhance the quality of a child, especially in primary school, right? How do you measure, for example, if you've taught a child self-confidence? Hugely powerful thing for a child to grow and highly complicated in the Indian rural setup where a teacher may be teaching multi-grade in the same class or multi-subject. And oftentimes somebody may bring their sibling along because they can't leave them somewhere because perhaps that's the midday meal is the only meal they'll get. So we spend a lot of time in education around teacher capacity enhancement. And I, and I must share this story because one of the things we do is, you know, we run sessions for teachers. Some of them are mandated by the government. Some of them are just, you know, optional. Um, on a Sunday where a teacher may have to travel 20, 30 kilometers on her own dime, on her own time, we'll feed them, right? So 
A teacher just comes to the job to be a better teacher. And think about organizations. How many of us could get in our companies somebody to come on a Sunday on their own dime, on their own time, just to be a better professional? So it's remarkable. You know, oftentimes we sort of judge, you know, government schools, government teachers. It's, it's amazing the kind of work. And I've been in the field in small towns and small villages in India. It's profound the kind of work that they're, they're doing. So that's a long gestation uh, focus for the foundation because education doesn't change overnight. It's difficult to see measure, measure change in small time frames that you're used to in a private corporation. But the other thing that we do, which we just started four years ago, is we're a grant-making organization. So we support vulnerable groups, you know, uh, women of domestic violence, adolescent girls, small and marginal farmers, people with disabilities, where we're funding NGOs doing fabulous work. And just by supporting them, we can help them disruptively scale. And the third thing which we talked about already is the university. You're not on social media. As somebody I'm, who runs an IT company and is in the tech space, like how do you survive without being on social media? You know, I'm profoundly shy. And so I don't enjoy being in the public space. And so I avoid it as much as I can. You know, I, I don't have an Instagram account, as I was telling you earlier. I do have a Facebook account, which I have posted once in the last five years. I have a Twitter account, which I'm not very active on as well. But this is a threat that I keep making that this is just, again, in the spirit of changing and the spirit of learning, being more sort of socially engaged is important. But again, you know, it's not in my natural fiber. So we'll have to find the right balance. He said he didn't like to be in the public eye. In the job that you now hold, you are in the public eye. So hopefully right. that will be one of the changes that you make as well. We, I haven't, I don't know what everyone sitting here thought, but I haven't heard a young mind articulate his views on where his company is and where he hopes to take it quite as articulately and with as much passion as Rishad Premji has at the India Today Conclave. Can we have a very warm, warm round of applause as we thank Rishad thank for you. having joined us here at the Conclave. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very thanks, much. Thanks, Pleasure thanks, having pleasure, you. Thank you.